Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley, and in this video I'm going to be talking about another one of the volumes in this series of old works of Scottish theology, the Cunningham Lectures. Now the lectureship's still there, there are still Cunningham Lectures, but our cut-off is basically going to be in the 1940s. At the moment we've reached number 20 in the series of lectures, though not 20 in this series of videos. And it's probably a good idea at this point to remind us all what the Cunningham Lectures are. The Cunningham Lectureship was founded in 1861 in memory of the Reverend William Cunningham, Principal of New College Edinburgh, founding father of the Free Church of Scotland, celebrated theologian and church historian. His church history, his historical theology, is still in print today and is still used in some seminaries as a textbook. The Cunningham Lectures were founded because William Binney Webster, the founder, who was a friend of Cunningham's, felt the Free Church of Scotland needed something equivalent to the Bampton Lectures in the Church of England or the Congregational Lectures that the Congregational Union of England and Wales, or England, England rather, had at the time. The idea was that every few years, every three years, one of the leading theologians, preachers, uh, ministers, thinkers of the Free Church of Scotland would give a series of lectures on a particular special topic of, of course, of his expertise to the students at New College Edinburgh, the flagship seminary of the Free Church, and that these lectures would be published afterwards in a book. And here are many of the books now. The 20th series here is the background of the Gospels, or Judaism, in the period between the Old and New Testaments, by William Fairweather, M.A.D.D., Minister of Dunnikir Free Church, Kirkcaldy. This is the third edition from 1920, but they originally delivered in 1907. So there's the title page. Once again, with the 20th series, we're looking at that uh, great phenomenon, the pastor-theologian. To describe William Fairweather in 1920 as of Dunnikia Free Church was to state that he had been there for the best part of 40 years. He had been appointed, it was his first charge, straight out of seminary. He was ordained in 1881 at Dunnikia. This is Memorials of Dunnikia Church, by, edited by William Fairweather. It's a volume that was published in 1897. He was the seventh minister of Dunnikia, ordained on the 28th of July, 1881, about six months after the previous minister had died. And there he is, William Fairweather, at about the time of his, well, at the time this book was published in the 1890s, so it's, it's about ten years before he gave the Cunningham Lecture. And there's old Dunnikia Church where he ministered. Now by the time the Cunningham Lectures were given, they were in a different building. The old church had been sold in 1901 to a factory that wanted to expand on the site, and a new church was built in a more prominent location in the town. You can still see it today, although the building is now used by the Roman Catholics. He remained at Dunikia until his death in 1942. Now, if you think 1881, he's ordained there. 1942, he dies and ceases to be pastor. Sixty years in the same pastorate is startling. It's not a 
common situation, but he was clearly a, a much loved minister. He was, as I say, a pastor theologian. The church at Dunakir was an interesting church because it was founded not as a free church of Scotland, but as a secession church associated with the seceding movement that, of course, traces its ancestry back to the Erskine brothers, among others. There we are. That's the interior of the old church. It's an old secession meeting house. And very much of the sort of design of these, that these old buildings tended to have. It traces its ancestry back to the 18th century, but in the 1850s, back there. In the 1850s the church decided to leave the secession movement and to join itself instead to the Free Church of Scotland. So that it went from being a secession church to a free church in the mid 1850s. This meant of course that when Union came about in 1900 it was a church that already thought, well, we actually have a lot in common with the United Presbyterian Church because our history and their history are much more entwined even than our history is with the Free Church of Scotland. Now, in 1929, the United Free Church, the majority of the United Free Church, went in to a union with the Church of Scotland. And again, William Fairweather, who had led the church at Dunikia into the Union of 1900, led it into the Union of 1929. But to go back and look at William Fairweather's career, he was born in Carmyle in 1856. He studied at Edinburgh University, where he did his arts course, MA, and then at New College, Edinburgh, where he held a Cunningham Fellowship in 1880. This was a sort of research fellowship. He was ordained, as I said, to Dunnikia in 1881. He married uh, Isabella Black in 1883, and she outlived him, but not by very much. His first book was published in 1898. Well, 1897, if you take Dunnikia memorials. 1898, in terms of the book that doesn't just say edited by, but written by. And it was this volume, From the Exile to the Advent, which deals with the history of the people of Israel between 587 BC and 4 AD. Of course, remember, there is no year zero. It goes from 1 BC to 1 AD. And also when the sums were done, someone messed up. And the result is that Jesus was almost certainly born in 3 or 4 AD. But this, of course, is the same subject that he would later choose to speak on much a much greater length when he did his Cunningham lectures. His other notable work that I have here is Origin and Greek Patristic Theology. This was published in 1901 in the series The World's Epoch Makers. And it engages with the brilliant but highly unorthodox Origin. But to come back to the Cunningham Lectures, it's a subject that's very, very important. Now, I've, I've read at the beginning that section out of Matthew's Gospel. And the first question that readers find themselves asking is, well, who's Herod and where does he come from? And then we find in the Gospels the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, who were they? Where do they come from? These people don't exist in the Old Testament. They don't exist not only before the exile, but even after the exile. The Pharisees are a name that appears in the New Testament, but not the Old. And so it's very important, actually, particularly for ministers, and of course these are for ministers and theologians in particular, but it's very helpful to understand what happened, well, as 
to give the title of Fairweather's first book, From the Exile to the Advent, What Happened Between the Exile and Christ's Coming into the World. The background, then, to the New Testament. He writes, in dealing with the theme chosen, the background of the Gospels, or Judaism in the period between the Old and New Testaments, I have been very conscious of the difficulty of doing it justice within the limits of a few chapters. The period embraced is that beginning with the Maccabean Revolt and ending with the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus. These two important events, celebrated by the interval of 235 years, mark off a well-defined section of the history of the nation. The external history has been narrated only so far as necessary to make clear the development of Judaism. Some readers may, hear, may feel that here and there, as in chapter 3, many of the historical details might have been dispensed with, but in view of the vital significance of the Maccabean movement for later Judaism, I have deemed it best to give reasonable prominence to the facts. This period of Judaism is one so characterised by opposing tendencies that at first sight it seems difficult to discover a line of development running through the varying phenomena of the national life. Close investigation, however, makes it clear that the later Judaism represents a religion in the stage of transition from a narrower to a wider phase. We see here the national on the way to become universal, and the ceremonial in process of being superseded by the spiritual. Because, of course, the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the, the diaspora, the scattering of the Jews, means that Judaism had to change. The temple could no longer have precisely the same role it had when they were a united nation. The temple instead was something that you went to a few times a year. But the centre of Jewish worship for most Jews became the synagogue. And again, the synagogue is something that develops in the exile, but then develops even more in that intertestamental period. Now, this is a book that's written in 1907. It reflects scholarship as it was in 1907. Modern scholarship has in some ways moved on. We've done things, well, the most notable thing to affect the, the way we, we see intertestamental Judaism is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls opened to us a, a sect of Judaism that was basically unknown before their discovery. Now, there are those who identify the Dead Sea sect with the Essenes of Josephus. But Josephus' description of the Essenes really says if, if the Essenes are the Dead Sea sect, then Josephus is basically making stuff up and misrepresenting them, perhaps through ignorance. So the Dead Sea Scrolls have changed how we see intertestamental Judaism. It is, of course, unnecessary, or should be, to say this is written before the, devel the development of the, the so-called new perspectives on Paul, which challenge certain of the suppositions about Judaism. It's also important to say that this is a book written under the influence of the German high critical scholarship, which tended to push the book of Daniel forward into the Maccabean era, and also that said quite a lot of the Psalms were Maccabean. Now, today, as from an evangelical perspective, you say, well, actually, why is it that people want to push Daniel forward in the Maccabean era? Well, it's because in, in the second half of Daniel, there's such a clear prediction of Antiochus Epiphanes that if you don't believe in predictive prophecy, you've got to say, well, therefore, this is written at the time of Antiochus in the Maccabean era. So... These are some of the issues with this book. At the same time, it's a very helpful subject to consider, and it's one that we need to think about. Because what you have in the intestinal period, you have initially Judea is a, a, a province of the Persian Empire. Alexander the Great and his Greeks, they then mess this up, these Macedonians, they then mess this up by invading the Persian Empire and conquering it. 
And there is then the, the division between Alexander's generals at his death, which leaves Judea as part of a, a, a sort of Syrian kingdom. And it's this Syrian kingdom that leads to the Maccabean revolt. The Maccabean revolt has as a major element to it the attempt to impose a sort of uh, Grecian culture upon the Jews, and particularly attempt to disrupt Jewish worship. And a catalyst is a disagreement as the appointment of the high priest. And so all of these things help us in understanding how things ended up the way they are in the Galilee and Judea of the Gospels. Fairweather writes again, down to the Maccabean period, the growth of Judaism had been as nothing compared to the expansion which it underwent in the days of the later Hasmoneans and Herod, both in Palestine itself and beyond. There was thus gradually formed a new fellowship unconnected with the national life, worldwide, multilingual, yet binding all its members into a close spiritual unity, and surpassing in its intensity anything previously witnessed on the field of religion. Josephus recognises this special characteristic of Judaism when he points out that constitution is neither a monarchy, nor an oligarchy, nor a democracy, and of course those are all the kinds of government that the ancient pagan world recognised, but no, it was a theocracy. The designation is approach enough. It was a new word coined to describe a new thing. The development of the national religion into the church. So he explains the way that Judaism becomes a church more than a nation. Antiochus and the Maccabean struggle are very important and so a chapter is dedicated to them. Then the post-Maccabeans, then the Herodian Age, the, apo the apocalyptic movement. Now the apocalyptic movement, of course, some of it dealing with Daniel, for example, we have to step back and say, yes, but is this not imposing categories? But it also deals with things like the, the Book of Enoch, these works that appear in the intertestamental period. And it's these books that people are very interested in right now for a variety of reasons, some of which are just strange. Um, but people are interested in this sort of esoterica. And in this book, Fairweather deals with the esoterica. What does it mean? Where does it come from? But he speaks of uh, the Maccabean struggle. It is not easy to figure out to figure to ourselves the strange personality of Antiochus. He was a puzzle even to his contemporaries. Rational people, says Polybius, were at a loss what to think about him. Some regarded him as a simple and homely man. Others looked upon him as crazed. The former estimate was based upon his tendency to fraternise with any sort of people he chanced to meet. The other found expression in the popular parody of the surname Epiphanes, into Epimanes, the madman, the loony. He was certainly a successful soldier and an acute diplomatist, and if he had many eccentricities, he was so amply atoned for by his kingly munificence as to secure for him considerable popularity. But to his character there was a, a darker side also. It is clear from his treatment of the Jews there was an element of savagery in his composition. We can scarcely account for this on the theory of insanity, pure and simple, although previous to his death he does appear to have suffered from serious mental aberration. Whatever he was, Antiochus was not a mere maniac. A maniac would have been less dangerous. It's interesting, of course, to look at him and compare him with, with later tyrants like Adolf Hitler. Now, Adolf Hitler's very similar to Antiochus Epiphanes in many ways. Antiochus seems to have provided the image and the language of Antichrist. And looking at Antiochus like this helps us to appreciate the idea of the Antichrist. But again, he, he deals with the formation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Who were they and why were they? What was it 
that prepared the world for Jesus and what was the, the nation into which he came. And that's where studying the background of the Gospels is helpful because it prevents us from approaching it from a, an ahistorical perspective. Now here we are in the 21st century, in the 2020, the third decade of the 21st century now so removed from these things it's so easy for us and we live in an age that's sadly historically almost illiterate so easy for people to just assume that things then were the way they are now this is not the case and so William Fairweather the background of the Gospels a fascinating book and a vitally important subject as we seek to study the Gospels and how God has revealed himself in history in the midst of the ages. Well, thank you for watching, and may God help you in the reading of his book, and in the reading of the best books that help us to understand Christ and his times. Thank you for watching again, and may God bless you and keep you. Amen.